Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 2 The Constitution of the Soul Sankhya Yoga Verse 2.1 Sanjaya said, The Supreme Lord Madhusudana then spoke the following words unto grief-stricken Arjuna, who was overwhelmed with compassion and whose sorrowful eyes were brimming with tears. Verse 2.2 The Supreme Lord said, O Arjuna, why has such illusion overcome you at this critical moment? This is unbefitting a noble man, Aryan. It is an obstacle to the attainment of heaven and a destroyer of good name and fame. Verse 2.3 O son of Kunti, Give up this cowardice, for it does not become you. O great hero, cast off this petty weakness of heart and arise for battle. Verse 2.4 Arjuna said, O Madhusudana, killer of the enemy, how can I counteract shooting arrows at my grandsire Bhishma? and teach Drona, who are worthy of my worship. Verse 2.5 It is better to live in this world by begging, without taking the lives of our great noble elders and teachers. Otherwise, by killing them, we shall only live in this world to enjoy their wealth and properties, tainted with their blood. Verse 2.6 We cannot understand which will be better for us, victory or defeat, because those sons of Dhritarashtra, whom, if we killed, we should not care to live, now stand before us on the battlefront. Verse 2.7 Now I am bewildered, what is my real duty, overwhelmed by apprehension for the fall of our dynasty? I am begging you to please tell me clearly which course of action is most beneficial for me. I am your surrendered disciple. Kindly instruct me. Verse 2.8 Even if we obtain an unrivaled expanding empire on earth and supremacy over the kingdom of heaven. I cannot find anything to allay this sadness, which is leaving me senseless. Verse 2.9 Sanjaya said, In this way, the chastiser of the enemy, the intensely alert Arjuna, addressed Krishna, who is the lord of the senses, of all beings. Then he declared, Govinda, I will not fight, and fell silent. Verse 2.10 O Bharata, thereafter Sri Rishikesha, in the midst of both armies, smilingly addressed the grief-stricken Arjuna as follows. Verse 2.11 The Lord said, O Arjuna, you are mourning for that which is unworthy of grief, and yet speaking words of wisdom. But the wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. Verse 2.12 Never was there a time when I, you, or all these kings did not exist. As we are at present, so have we been in the past and shall continue to be in the future. Verse 2.13 As the embodied living being gradually passes in this body from childhood to youth to old age, so also that soul attains yet another body at death. The learned are not deluded by such a transformation. Verse 2.14 O son of Kunti, 
Only the engagement of the senses with their objects give rise to the sensation for cold, heat, pleasure and pain. But these effects are temporary. They come and go. Therefore, O Bharata, you are to endure them. Verse 2.15 O noblest of men, a person of steady intelligence, equipoised in pleasure and pain, undisturbed by sensual experiences, is certainly eligible for liberation. Verse 2.16 Of the changeable, such as the body, there is no everlasting existence. Of the everlasting soul, there is no transformation or destruction. Seers of the truth have thus distinguished and analyzed the nature of both eternal reality and temporary illusion. Verse 2.17 Know that the soul who pervades the entire body is imperishable. He is unchangeable and everlasting, and no one can destroy him. Verse 2.18 Only these physical bodies of the eternal, indestructible and immeasurable soul are subject to destruction. Therefore, fight, O Bharata, and do not give up your natural religious principles. Verse 2.19 Those who think that the living being is a slayer and those who think that he is slain are both ignorant of the true nature of the soul. The soul neither slays nor is slain. Verse 2.20 The soul is never born and he never dies nor does he repeatedly come into being and undergo expansion, because he is unborn and eternal. He is inexhaustible, ever youthful, yet ancient. Although the body is subject to birth and death, the soul is never destroyed. Verse 2.21 O Parta, how can a person who knows the soul to be constant, indestructible, birthless, and inexhaustible, kill anyone or cause anyone to be killed. Verse 2.22 As a person accepts new dress, rejecting that which is old and worn, so also the soul continues to accept a new body giving up the old and useless one. Verse 2.23 Weapons cannot pierce the soul, and fire cannot burn him. He can neither be moistured with water nor dried by the air. Verses 2.24-25 The soul is indivisible and cannot be burned, moistured, or dried up. He is everlasting, constant, unchangeable, and ever-existent. Nothing can obstruct his passage. This soul is imperceptible, inconceivable, and unaffected by the sixfold mutations birth, existence, growth, maturity, diminution, and destruction. Therefore, knowing the soul in this way, you can no longer lament. Verses 2.26-27 And, O best of warriors, even if you think that the soul is perpetually subject to birth and death, you still have no reason to lament. For one who is born, death is certain. And for one who dies, he must be reborn 
to undergo the reactions of his past actions. Therefore, you should not lament over the inevitable. Verse 2.28 O Bharata, when all living entities are unmanifest before birth, manifest between birth and death, and again unmanifest at death, why lament for them? This conclusion is not corroborated by saintly authorities, but if it is accepted for the sake of argument, your duty is still to fight to uphold your natural religious principles. Verse 2.29 Some see the soul as astonishing, some describe him as astonishing, some hear of him as astonishing, while others even after hearing about him, cannot understand him at all. Verse 2.30 O Bharata, the soul dwelling within the bodies of all living beings, is eternal and cannot be slain. Therefore, you should not lament for anybody. Verse 2.31 Moreover, considering your Svadharma, you have no reason to waver since no action is more beneficial for a Kshatriya than fighting for religious justice. Commentary Svadharma or the natural duty of the living entity is of two types according to the condition of either his bondage or liberation. In the liberated stage, Svadharma is devoid of the superfluous color or impetus which is found in the Svadharma of material bondage. Actually, pure Svadharma, Shuddha Svadharma, is the liberated soul's absorption in engaging his every attempt for the divine pleasure of the Supreme Lord. On the other hand, the soul in material bondage accepts various births throughout 8,400,000 species of life according to the fruits of his past actions, until, by dint of pious or virtuous actions, he obtains a human birth. Then, according to his particular nature and movements, he adopts a position in Deva Varn Ashram, the God centered, graded socio religious system as a favorable means of attaining pure Svadharma of the liberated state. Thus, the practice of this favorable means is also known as Svadharma in a general way. In other words, as smoke covered fire, is still known as fire regardless of its covering. Similarly, although the original Shuddha Svadharma of the soul may appear to be slightly covered, it is nonetheless counted as Svadharma within the consideration of the God-centered socio-religious system of Varn Ashram Dharma. Verse 2.32 O Partha, such a battle, present of its own accord, like the open gates of heaven, can be gained only by the most fortunate warriors. Verse 2.33 In fact, if you choose not to engage in this war of religious justice, your religious principles will be lost, fame will desert you, and sin will overcome you. Verse 2.34 People will speak of your infamy for all time to come, and for the renowned infamy is worse than death. Verse 2.35 Those great warriors who have highly honored you will ridicule you, considering that you were afraid to fight. Verse 
36. Your enemies will scorn your abilities with many insulting words. What could be more painful? Verse 2.37 O Conteia, if you are killed, you will attain heaven, and if you are victorious, you will enjoy the earth. Therefore, being confident of your success, arise for battle. Verse 2.38 Knowing pleasure and pain, gain and loss, and victory and defeat, to be one and the same, fight. You will be unaffected by sin. Verse 2.39 I have just explained to you the wisdom of the conception of reality. Now hear of the conception of devotional service or bhakti yoga. O Partha, by buddhi yoga, engaging your intelligence in devotion, you will be able to completely cut the bondage of action. Commentary It will be shown herein that buddhi yoga is a singular path. When this buddhi yoga is seen to be limited by the ideal of action, it is known as karma yoga. When it extends beyond karma up to the utmost limit of knowledge, it is known as jnana yoga or shankya yoga. And when transcending the limitations of both jnana and karma, it touches bhakti or devotion. It is then known as bhakti yoga or perfectly pure and complete buddhi yoga. Srila Bhakti Not Thakur. Verse 2.40 Even a small beginning in this devotional service cannot go in vain, nor can any loss be suffered. The most insignificant practice of such devotional service saves one from the all-devouring fear of repeated birth and death in this world. Commentary Generally, Mahabhaya is taken as the all-devouring fear of repeated birth and death in this world of exploitation. But Mahabhaya also refers to Sayujya Mukti, the liberation of merging into the impersonal, non-differentiated consciousness of Brahmaloka, Viraja or Samadhi. Renunciation leads to Sayujya Mukti, the full stop of birth and death, but not alive in the positive plane. It takes one to a permanent burial in Brahmaloka. The demon of Mukti will devour one wholesale, and therefore it is even more dangerous than this ordinary worldly life of action and reaction. Mukti means a strike in the organic system, so it must be avoided. To either abuse duties in a factory or to declare a strike by cessation of duties are both abnormal. Bhukti, exploitation, and Mukti, renunciation, are both fearsome ghosts. Therefore, Mahabhaya means the great apprehension to falling prey to both the ghost of exploitation leading to repeated birth and death as well as the ghost of committing suicide by merging into the impersonalism of incarceration in Brahmaloka, fear of both Bhogabhumi, the plane of exploitation, and Dhyagabhumi, the plane of renunciation. It is stated in the Bhaktiras Amrita Sindhu, Bhukti Mukti Priya Yavad Pisaji Ridi 
vartati tavat bhakti sukhas yatra katam abhyudayo bhavet. As long as the two ghosts of exploitation and renunciation remain haunting the heart, the ecstasy of devotion to Krishna will never awaken there. Bhakti Ras Amrita Sindhu 1.2.22 Anabilashita shunyam jnana karmadi anamritam anakulyena krishna anushilanam bhaktir utama The highest devotion is that which pleases exclusively the Supreme Lord Krishna and it is devoid of any desire apart from his service. It is not covered by the action of daily or customary duties, karma, nor by the knowledge that searches for the impersonal, non-differentiated aspect of the Absolute, jnana, nor by the meditational attempt to become one with the Lord, yoga. Bhakti Ras Amrita Sindhu 1.1.9 Only the Supreme Lord is Abhaya, beyond apprehension. Therefore, only participation in his service can free one from the ghosts of exploitation and renunciation, bhukti and mukti. If we subtract bhukti and mukti, then only positive bhakti, devotion, is the remainder. Therefore, without bhakti, everything is maha bhaya, great danger. Verse 2.41 O descendants of the Kuru dynasty, intelligence engaged in exclusive devotion unto me is one-pointed and firmly situated in me, since I am its only goal. But the intelligence of those who avoid exclusive devotion to me is played and characterized by endless desires because of its absorption in innumerable sense objects. Verses 2.42-44 to Oparta, those lascivious and ignorant persons who have no knowledge that the chief purpose of the Vedas is the attainment of the supreme truth, are always concerned with interpretations of its indirect trivial aspects. They say, there is nothing worth knowing beyond this. Desirous of enjoying the fruits of their actions, and seeking the attainment of heaven, those fools are attracted by the apparently enchanting but ultimately poisonous words of the Karmakanda sections of the Vedas, wherein many processes of sacrifice and other rituals are described, which yield wealth, sense enjoyment, good birth, and the fruits of one's actions. Deluded by these flowery words, and enamored by worldly pleasures and opulence, the intelligence of such indiscriminate persons does not attain the resolute determination of exclusive and uninterrupted dedication to the Supreme Lord. Bhagavad Gita verse 2.45 O Arjuna, when defining non-devotional paths based on action and knowledge, the Vedas deal with the three modes of material nature. Foolish man, whose intelligence is covered by exploitation and renunciation, 
engage themselves in the cultivation of action and knowledge. Thus, they remain in ignorance of the principal object aimed at by the Vedas, which is transcendence beyond the three modes of material nature. But Arjuna, you be free from duality. Live in the association of my eternal devotees and give up all pursuits for gain and preservation. Then, by Buddhi Yoga, dedicating your intelligence to me, reach that plane which is free from material qualities and situate yourself in that transcendence which is the object of the Vedas. In other words, withdrawing yourself from the cultivation of action and knowledge, engage exclusively in the path of devotion, as commanded by the Vedas. Verse 2.46 All the purposes served by several tiny pawns can at once be served better by a large lake. Similarly, the results obtained by worshipping various demigods through respective Vedic prayers may at once be surpassed by exclusive devotion unto me. Such devotion is the one and only direction of the Vedas. A self-realized person who is thus in full knowledge of the essence of the Vedas, fulfills all necessities by exclusively worshipping the Supreme Lord in devotion. Verse 2.47 I shall now describe Nishkama Karma Yoga, the path of selfless action. You have a right to perform your natural prescribed duties but you are not entitled to any fruits of that action. You should neither act with desire to enjoy the fruits of your work, nor, as a result, should you be attached to neglecting your duties. Verse 2.48 O Dhananjaya, after giving up desire for the fruits of action, Situate yourself on the path of devotion, bhakti yoga. Equally disposed to success and failure, carry out the duties prescribed according to your nature. To remain equipoised in either success or failure of the outcome of action is certainly known as yoga. Verse 2.49 Odananjaya Fruitive action is extremely abominable in comparison to Buddhi Yoga or equilibrium in selfless action. Those who crave the fruits of their actions are misers. They are impoverished, being full of desires. Therefore, Take shelter of the intelligence of which selfless action is the aim and objective. Verse 2.50 A person who is not motivated by desire to enjoy the fruits of his actions rids himself of both good and bad deeds within this very life. Engage, therefore, in the path of selfless action, since such buddhi yoga or equilibrium in selfless action is certainly the art of action. Verse 2.51 Wise men of steady intelligence liberate themselves from the bondage of birth by renouncing the fruits of born of action. Thus, they enter into that state of divine tranquility 
which is attainable only by the devotees. Verse 2.52 Thus, when your intelligence fully emerges from the dense forest of delusion, you will be indifferent to all the trivia either heard previously or to be heard in the future. Verse 2.53 Thereafter, when your intelligence is no longer disturbed by the various interpretations of the Vedas, then, naturally, remaining fixed in undeviating trance, samadhi, you will attain to the path of pure devotion. Verse 2.54 Arjuna said, O Keshava, what are the symptoms of properly adjusted persons who are absorbed in perfect meditation? What do they say and how do they respond to external sense objects, both publicly and privately? I wish to know how they conduct themselves in their endeavors. Verse 2.55 The Supreme Lord said, O Partha, one who, having abandoned all mundane aspirations, relishes the ecstasy of full internal self-satisfaction. Within his chaste heart is to be known as a person of properly adjusted wisdom. Verse 2.56 One who is undisturbed by the threefold miseries, disinterested in mundane pleasures, and free from attachment, fear, and anger, is known as a sage of properly adjusted intelligence. Verse 2.57 1. Devoid of mundane affection, neither elated nor resentful in the face of worldly blessings or curses, is certainly a person whose intelligence is firmly established in divine trance. Verse 2.58 When he controls his senses by totally withdrawing them from the sense objects at will, like the tortoise who withdraws its limbs within its shell, then his intelligence is perfectly established. Verse 2.59 Although the person of gross corporeal consciousness may avoid sense objects by external renunciation, his eagerness for sense enjoyment remains within. However, inner attachment to sense objects is spontaneously denounced by the person of properly adjusted intelligence due to his having had a glimpse of the all-attractive beauty of the supreme truth. Verse 2.60 O son of Kunti, even the mind of a man of sound judgment who is aspiring for liberation is forcefully carried away by the mentally agitated senses. Klammer, yet there is no such possibility for one whose heart has become attracted to me. Verse 2.61 By the practice of perfect devotion to me, the Bhakti Yogi brings his senses under proper control. He whose senses are controlled is truly intelligent. Verse 2.62 On the other hand, when a person attempting the non-devotional path of renunciation contemplates the sense objects, 
he gradually becomes attached to them and desire is born. Desire is generated from attachment and when desire is forcibly checked, anger arises. Verse 2.63 From anger, delusion arises and the power of delusion causes forgetfulness. Forgetfulness destroys good intelligence, and when intelligence fails, one loses all. Verse 2.64 However, a true devotee on the path of renunciation in devotion, Yukta Vairagya, acts exclusively for my transcendental satisfaction. Abandoning attachment and ennui, although accepting sense objects with his control senses, he attains full contentment of heart. Verse 2.65 When one gains contentment of heart, all his miseries are vanquished. Such a person's intelligence soon becomes fully fixed upon his desired goal. Therefore, only by bhakti, devotion, can one attain a tranquil heart. Verse 2.66 A person with uncontrolled sense has no power of judgment, and his thoughts are meaningless. One who has no purity of thought cannot attain peace, and without peace of mind, how can one hope to attain true happiness? Verse 2.67 Because a boat on the ocean is trust hither and thither by an unfavorable wind. Similarly, the mind which runs after the senses that loiter amongst sensual objects snatches away the intelligence of the male-adjusted, unengaged person. Verse 2.68 Therefore, you should know, O subduer of the enemy, that one whose senses have been completely withdrawn from the sensual objects through renunciation in devotion, yukta vairagya, is surely a man of perfectly adjusted intelligence. Verse 2.69 while spiritual awareness is like night for the living beings enchanted by materialism, the self-realized soul remains awake, directly relishing the divine ecstasy of his uninterrupted spiritual intelligence. On the contrary, the wakefulness of materialistic persons addicted to sense enjoyment, is night for the self-realized person who is completely indifferent to such pursuits. The realized souls, indifferent to the mundane, are ever joyful in the divine ecstatic plane, while the general mass is infatuated by fleeting mundane fancies, devoid of spiritual joy. Klama, this is the essential purpose. Verse 2.70 The fathomless ocean, always full in itself, is never disturbed, although many rivers and streams enter into it. Similarly, a person of steady intelligence is never agitated if provocative sensual temptations enter 
into him. Therefore, he alone attains peace, which is forever unattainable for the sensual pleasure hunters. Verse 2.71 Giving up all kinds of sensual desires, unattached to the sense objects, free from false ego and false sense of possessiveness. Certainly, such a person attains tranquility, having entered into his divine relationship with the absolute truth. Verse 2.72 O Parta, this is known as the positive stage of realization of the eternal absolute truth, attaining to which a person is never again deluded by the course of mundane existence. Even at the time of death, only momentary attainment of this state leads one to the divine abode.